Welcome, Slayer the Alchemist, and welcome to another Sabbath Sunday. This is where Darren and I get together with you on Sundays to discuss all things Black Sabbath. Darren and I have a Black Sabbath podcast that we do together. It's called Into the Void, a Black Sabbath podcast. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. In our most recent episode, as of the making of this video, uh, was on The Eternal Idol, the first album to feature Tony Martin. And we thought it would be fun to do an episode here on Sabbath Sunday, where we discussed how Black Sabbath changed during the Tony Martin years. So this really isn't about, I mean, we're going to talk about Tony Martin. His name is, of course, going to come up, but it's really more about how the sound of Black Sabbath and what Black Sabbath was changed during the uh, during the Tony Martin years. So... All right, Darren, so for you, you know, what do you hear as the, uh, how did Black Sabbath change when Tony Martin, during that era of the band? I think primarily the production quality got to a point where it was really uh, <clears throat> contemporary. It, it started to sound like a lot of other things that were coming out at the time. And uh, also the keyboard started to take more of a, of a frontal place in the sound of Black Sabbath, particularly maybe not so much an eternal idol, although it, it's it started at that point. But by the time Headless Cross came out, the keyboards were much more in the forefront. And it wasn't keyboards in a traditional rock sense of like organ or piano. It was more like synthesized sounds, uh, some used in sound effects, you know, like the gates of hell or in the beginning of uh, when death calls and I'm, I'm talking about headless cross headless crosses yeah. I think when it really things started to shift and a lot of people like headless cross and there's things about it that I like too but when you hold it up against the Dio era or the Ozzy era it's very distinctly different and so much so that it kind of blends into a lot of other things that were, were taking place musically at the time. I mean, I, I've, I've often referenced White Snake when I, when I talk about Headless Cross, and there, and there is a bit of that. It, there's a bit of more of a commercial vibe that, that's taking place in and around this era. <clears throat> and of course, Tony Martin's voice is, is very different from Dio and Ozzy, but I think if we had a different producer, if maybe Martin Birch was back at the production helm and was bringing some of that mob rule sound into, into what was into the albums that were taking place, the late eighties, early nineties, I, I think it might've made a difference. So, I mean, obviously the singer is a large characteristic of the band sound and, and there is a marked difference between Tony Martin, but I mean, there's also other things that, that are happening too. And I think um, another aspect is Tony Iommi's guitar tone, I think, started to get a little bit safer sounding, a little bit more antiseptic. And we talked about this on our podcast for Eternal Idol. I guess what I really started to notice, it was Seven Star, but that kind of gets it gets a pass a little bit because it was intended to be a solo album. So he wasn't yeah. really he didn't really approach it from the mindset of a Black Sabbath album. So that gets a pass. But now that we're into internal idol, then that get same guitar sound from seven star, the songs are better in my opinion, but the guitar sound is still pretty polite. There isn't that raw, heavy, yeah, whatever you want to call it. I'm not a guitar player, but the overdriven. It becomes very heavy. processed kind of a elect, it's you know, not. It doesn't have that organic sound that yeah. he tended to have before that. And so unfortunately, I think Tony Martin takes a lot of the blame for this stuff, but I don't think it's entirely his <laughs> fault. I would be really curious if you were to take, and I know there's a lot of people on YouTube that that do amazing things with, you know, going in and switching things around yeah. and mashing songs together. But I'd be interested to hear Tony Martin's voice on Mob Rules, mm -hmm. how that album would sound and if it would, if you had that production, that sort of production quality applied to Eternal Idol, Headless Cross, Tear, and Cross Purposes, although I'm, I'm cool with Tear. I, 
tears a little bit, it's moving away from the big sound that was on Headless Cross. And, but it's, it's still there. It still has that, that early 90s, late 80s, early 90s commercial sound to it. But I think by the time Cross Purposes comes around, it sort of comes into its own and it's a little bit darker. And I think Tony's, Tony Iommi's guitar tone is a little less overproduced, but I'd be curious to hear uh, th those first two albums, Eternal Idol and Headless Cross with a di different production quality, darker production quality, something more focused on the guitar, better guitar tone, less keyboards. I mean, this isn't the first time keyboards have entered into a Black Sabbath album. Of course, you know, we go back to Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Yeah. But those are more or less flourishes. This is like, you really hear the, the keyboards are sort of running neck and neck with the guitar and the guitar yeah. tone itself is very polite. And I think that's, I think that's a large part of the difference with this era of the band. And Tony Martin, again, I have to say Tony Martin gets a lot of the blame, but I don't think it's entirely his fault. So yeah, that, that, that's my perspective on it anyway. Yeah. For me, uh, I was thinking, thinking, and I agree with, with everything you, you say, the, the mix, uh, starts to become very modern. Uh, what's going on at the time? You mentioned White Snake. I always think of Blue Murder for some reason, maybe because that Tony too. Martin has a loose connection to Blue Murder. But that yeah. kind of like production, that kind of guitar sound, very pro kind of process. Um, his guitar is a little far back on like Headless Cross and Tear. And you're right, the keyboards are sort of there, but they're not in a they're not in a real John Lord type of grinding riffing along with the guitar way. They're more in like a synth pad, mm -hmm. a textural kind of way, which, uh, you know, might be okay to fill out some sounds here and there, but it, but it is kind of a lot and it does make it dates those albums a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, when we did our eternal idol podcast, I, I talked about how for me, the eternal <laughs> idol, feels like for me the tony martin era feels like it properly starts on headless cross and there's a few reasons for that one if you listen to our podcast we go way into into depth into this martin comes in very late in the process for the eternal idol taking over for ray gillen so there's part of that he doesn't exert himself on the songwriting until headless cross and for me there still sounds like there's riffs and some feels and things that maybe Iomi might have had sitting in his back pocket since Born Again, or maybe even Mob Rules. You know, it's kind of hard to connect it to the Ozzy era, but it just still seems to be some sort of connection to the past. Yeah. Headless Cross Forward, it's a different thing. And when I think of Black Sabbath, and I, I think of I think of them in three distinct musical phases. You have the Ozzy years, which are characterized by Every album is a little different. Uh, they experiment with things. They're sort of creating this style of music that we all know and love now called heavy metal and doom metal. You know, they're doing a lot of different things, uh, as a lot of bands were doing in the 70s, experimenting with stuff. Then the next phase for me is the Dio phase. And the music changes with Dio. We no longer have this sort of jazz swing influence that we had through the 70s we don't really get any swingy type of tunes during the do era. it gets a little bit more uh this just the songs have more chords in them they're a little bit more arranged in that sense but we don't get a lot of like crazy tempo changes like we did during the 70s and stuff but there's more chords going on there's a lot more going on with the melody lines because of ronnie uh the subject matter of the band changes uh slightly so that's a phase for me. Now I'm going to discard uh, Seven Star because, like you mentioned earlier, that was intended to be a solo album. Eternal Idol, I can still sort of connect it back to. Now, like Born Again, for instance, obviously Ian Gillen changes the sound of the band, but there's still songs on there that I could hear. I could hear Keep It Warm or the song Born Again being done during the Ozzy era, or I could hear Zero the Hero being done by Ronnie. You know what I mean? So it, it still feels to me musically like it's still in the ballpark of what they were doing with Dio. The Eternal Idol, like I said, I can sort of connect it to that. Headless Cross, it's a totally different 
different thing. I don't hear anything from the 70s. There's no jazz. There's no swing. There's no crazy rhythmic tempo changes where they're playing really straight. And then all of a sudden they're swinging. There's none of that. Uh, there's also none of the slightly adventurous, kind of adventurous songwriting during the Dio years. You know, we're not getting any sign of the Southern Cross. We're not getting a Children of the Sea. We're not getting, uh, you know, that had the song Heaven and Hell. We're, we're not getting things like that during the Tony Martin era. For, during Headless Cross and on, and I'm also discarding Dehumanizer because that, of course, is Ronnie and sort of throws itself back to the Ronnie era. During the, those Martin years with Headless Cross and on, uh, the band becomes very kind of straightforward and very, for lack of a better word, heavy metal, you know, the heavy metal of that time. Uh, Sabbath, always a metal band, but they weren't really consciously a metal band during the 70s. You know, right. they were inventing it, not, you know, and when Ronnie was in the band, yeah, they were really heavy, but these albums, Headless Cross, Tear, they sound to me very, like we've said, very in that time. Like there's a lot of songs that sound like they could have been done by other metal bands at that time, which mm -hmm. Sabbath was always a band that had a, its own really strong sort of individual identity, almost like they're just doing their own thing. This is the first time with Headless Cross where it feels like they're kind of just going along with what everybody else is doing. That doesn't mean it's bad. I, you know, let's make this clear. Darren and I both love the, the Tony Martin years, but it does lose that experimental quality of the 70s it, it loses that really special unique songwriting quality of the do years i think, uh, it, I think it takes on its own identity and yeah it, it does and but for me it it becomes a little bit more straightforward yeah it does. iomi's sound becomes less distinct the whole band in general, their mixes become less unique. The songs become more straightforward. You know, we're just sort of getting just kind of straightforward kind of metal songs. And uh, it's not Tony Martin's fault. You know, we, we you know, we don't want to sound like we're, we're blaming this. I think he has a great, unique voice. It's just the production, I think. I think the style, I don't know if it was a conscious thing. Cozy Pal is a way different drummer than Vinnie Appice or Bill Ward. Uh, Neil Murray is a way different bass player than Geezer. Uh, so all these things kind of pull the band in a different direction that makes them sit more in, like we mentioned already, the White Snake, Blue Murder, that kind of late 80s uh, metal thing. And it does lose a little bit of its special quality and so like we talked about in the podcast i can completely understand why somebody who discovered sabbath with dio or with ozzy may not like some of this stuff because it's a little bit too kind of straightforward heavy metal if you will which sabbath was never really just a heavy metal band they always did a lot of different things you know they were always even with dio they were even with gillen born again album there's a lot of things going on and it, it becomes a little bit more straightforward during the during the tony martin years and sometimes i'm really in the mood for that and i'm just really dive into that but i almost have to put myself in a different headspace i almost have to like be like Okay, you know, here's the black, here's headless cross, here's tear. I'm not even gonna if if you think too much about what came before that, it's just gonna sort of get you angry. <laughs> you just have to take it for what it is. They're good albums, good songs on them, but it's sort of morphed into a different band almost. Yeah. I, I do think that there's they haven't completely abandoned the concept of an epic because we have when death calls. Yeah. If you were to take that song and you would put Ronnie's voice in there and you would change mm -hmm. the production value and the keyboards are fine. You bring them down a little bit in the mix. They're they're really, really high in the mix. And um, and that's a little distracting because it, it introduces a completely different element. And you have, and that's the thing. I mean, you have different elements taking place in and around this era, and it's sort of overwhelming. If there was like one or two things that were different or something that was more suitable or or more of a contemporary nature maybe you can kind of wrap your head around it but when you have all these things 
converging at once, it it definitely, like you said, it kind of makes you angry. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? What are you doing? You, you didn't need to change the con- entire formula. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's going to be certain things that a, a new voice, a new a new singer is going to bring to the table. And sometimes, you know, the music will will center around the type of voice of the singer. And I, and I get that. Um, obviously, like you, you mentioned, you know, the music changed in a lot of different ways when, when Dio joined. And some of that was because he was also writing. Um, Tony Martin was able to write. I don't know how much we haven't really, I haven't really researched Headless Cross in depth to know who was doing what. But um, I know he was capable of writing. He played instruments. Um, maybe he had a part to play in that. Um, but I mean, the point is that there's there's a lot of different things to wrap your head around and things that they're first time ever type things. And um, and I remember when I, I, I heard the album in 1989 and it to me, it even then it sounded overproduced. Uh, even then I was wondering what's going on here. However, when I when I first found out about this album, I I saw the video probably on MTV and I was impressed that they seemed to be getting back into that epic Dio era because the video I saw mm-hmm. was the title track Headless Cross. I also liked the way that that Tony sang it. There was a little bit yeah. of roughness in his voice and I appreciated that. And But I remember also thinking, okay, so they have a guy that sounds kind of like Dio. So they're kind of, they're going back to the eighties era. Why didn't they just get Dio? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's going on because I, mean, I don't think at that point Dio's career was really thriving you know you're talking about late 80s I mean yeah I don't know but maybe the invitation wasn't extended but I did appreciate the fact that we were getting back into that especially when I was you're going off the title track Headless Cross I thought well this has more of an epic quality then I got to the album and you start hearing songs like Call of the Wild yeah um devil and daughter yeah killing in the spirit world and those exactly fit your description of more traditional heavy metal yeah sort of nondescript you know you could you could take these songs and you could put them on a blue murder album you could take them and you could probably have david coverdale sing them on a white snake album at least devil and daughter i mean i i can hear you can hear those as a white snake album so the band starts to lose its identity and it's because of you know all these different first time ever things occurring on this album and um, and I could see somebody who's you know very traditional, whether they're you know you, you could have your Black Sabbath fan that got into the band on the Ozzy era, but hung in there through the Dio era, and you know and like that too. But then upon hearing the Tony Martin era and everything that's going on and how different it is, putting the brakes on and say, all right, that's it, I'm out. <laughs> and I, I can understand that, and I I, I didn't get to that point. But I definitely, I categorized it as, as something different. When I, if somebody would ask me the name, my top five Black Sabbath albums, I can, or Black Sabbath songs, I could definitely tell you that none of the songs from Eternal Idol or Headless Cross, even though these albums are still pretty new, none of those songs would have been entered into my, my top five. You know, they, they, they were not, this was not an album. These were, these two albums at this point were not, what I would consider traditional sounding Black Sabbath albums or, or albums that were completely worthy of being classified as Black Sabbath at that time. So, yeah. And you've mentioned this in the, in the podcast and probably here on Sabbath Sunday, where you used to feel like it's all about Tony Iommi. And just as long as Tony Iommi's there, it's Black Sabbath. But as time has gone on, you've begun to realize that the other guys in the band are just as important. And, uh, and I agree with that. And when you take out, uh, when you take out Geezer, you lose twenty five percent of the Sabbath sound. When you take out Bill, you lose twenty five percent. Although I would say Vinny Appice slid into yeah. that position very well. He has a, lot a very of personality. A lot yeah, of personality. yeah. Vinny has a real distinct kind of drum style and sound that I think fit in the Black Sabbath really well. I like Cozy Pal how well he fits into the black sabbath sound well i don't know we'll save that for our headless cross podcast and for our sabbath sunday that's a topic on itself probably but when you lose all these elements and maybe that's why you know you talk about how you like cross purposes and i like cross purposes too well geezer comes back in the band Mm -hmm. 
and and also not only with geezer with his bass playing you're you're talking about the lyrics geezer's lyrics not there or ronnie's lyrics so there's a <laughs> lot of things changing and i think when uh you know after eternal idol and with the just the constant uh carousel of members coming in and out of black sabbath if you read yeah. about the, the history iomi realized like i've got to try to have somewhat of a stable lineup and that's how cozy pal comes in and cozy pal comes in with thinking like we're going to rebuild this thing it's sort of like a brand that has it's diminished <laughs> you know it's it, it's yeah. like the, the the uh the general public it doesn't don't hold it in as high esteem and so now they have to rebuild the brand even though again i really like eternal idol but they felt like they needed to rebuild it and they wanted to create a steady lineup. Thus, you get uh, you know, Cozy Pal coming in, eventually Neil Murray, and just trying to trying to stabilize things. But it does sort of bring it into a different direction. And it begs that age-old question. We talked about it on the podcast. If they had changed the name of the band, if they had called it something else, if they had called it the Headless Cross or whatever... <clears throat> When you have a band that has a legacy, as long as Black Sabbath, you can pick pick any band that's been around that long. Deep Purple, Genesis, Uriah Heep, you know, all these bands that have been around for a really long time that have had member changes throughout their careers. Uh, it's difficult because people associate, remember the band for their peak years or when they discovered them. And anything that follows after that, if it's too radical of a shift, it, you know, people have people have trouble with it because it's just automatically going to get compared to the glory days or when people discovered it and stuff like that. So, but again, like we said in a podcast, I always encourage people to, if you haven't explore this era of the band, there is a lot of good music. There is a lot of good songs. Clear your head. Go into it. Take it at face value. Imagine if somebody handed you a disc and said, here's this Lost Iomi project. And it, the band was called The Headless Cross. Here you go. Blam. You know, nobody would compare it to Black. I mean, it would get compared to Black Sabbath because it's Tony Iommi. But it wouldn't be as scrutinized, I think, as it is. And there's a lot of good things uh, from this era. There's a lot of things uh, to enjoy some of the problem with the era too. We talked about this in the podcast. It's been ignored for the most part. These albums have been out of print. It's always kind of never talked about. We're sitting here on our hands waiting as we've been for years now for this Tony Martin box set. It always feels like it never gets the respect that it deserves. You know, if this era of the band was treated with a little bit more respect from inside the Sabbath corporation organization yeah. maybe that would help too you know okay, well, at least if we could buy the records you know maybe the legacy of this this era of the band people maybe would have explored it more and discovered it more and appreciated it and liked it more but it's the stuff is out of print it never gets talked about whenever there, if you read a black sabbath biography and nine times out of ten this era just gets sort of glossed over you know unless unless it's a martin pop-off book martin pop-off's always good of covering all the all the eras of the band but you know it's just it seems like this era of the band just gets short changed a lot and it's it's a shame in, in certain situations and you you referenced genesis a little while ago um yeah i mean there was definitely a lot of changes taking place and it seemed like rather than introduce new members they just eliminated members as they went along but um Genesis in the 80s, definitely, they changed their sound radically. I mean, there's no comparison between something like Abacab and Trespass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yet, Abacab, moving forward, sold a lot more records. They, yeah. they introduced themselves, themselves to a larger market. So that worked. Likewise, yes. I mean, I, I'm going to, I don't know what the sales figures are for 90215, but I'm going to yeah. guess that it introduced a lot of people that some big hits and a lot more exposure. And that worked. It was a stylistic shift, big production, uh, yeah. different songwriting, a different songwriting approach. Um, yeah. So, I mean, sometimes it works. And, and maybe that was what Tony had intended to do, bring things into the current climate and basically give the band a reboot. And it might have taken off. But unfortunately, it didn't. 
Uh, so that's the chance you take, and that's the risk they took. And and here we are. You know, we're talking about the Tony Martin era as basically a footnote. You know, in Sabbath history, because yeah. a lot of people just weren't ready to accept it. And heavy metal's different. You know, the fans are more loyal. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's not one of the the things where it's something that can just be shifted as easily without the fans getting passionate about it. Heavy metal fans are very passionate. And when they take ownership of something, I think they get very guarded. And their feelings yeah. get hurt. <laughs> and sometimes it comes out <laughs> as anger. But when your favorite band is doing something that's radically different, it's upsetting. And I think that that, you know, with Black yeah. Sabbath is a heavy metal band. And that's kind of what makes them different from bands like Genesis and, and Yes. And yeah. like you even say Jethro Tull. I mean, Jethro Tull won a Grammy for what, what was the album? Rock Island? Uh, you, yeah, you, Crest you of know. the Nave or something like Yeah, one of those albums. Crest of the that. Nave. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It was Crest <laughs> of the Nave, which isn't a bad album, but it, again, it sounds more like Dire Straits than it does traditional <laughs> yeah. Jethro Tull. So yeah. there's another example of a band that midstream, somewhere around the middle of their career, decided. Yeah boom, we're going to change and this is what we're going to do. And, and here we are. And it was tremendously successful. But and and it should Sabbath. be mentioned too with Sabbath, if maybe if they were still with the major label, they move on to IRS with Headless Cross. I mean, I, fairly big label, but not on the level of an Atlantic Records or a Warner Brothers that they came from. So maybe if they were had moved on to, let's say, a label like they gone from Warner Brothers to Atlantic Records, another really big label that put a lot of money behind them, put a big name producer behind them. Maybe that era would have been different. Maybe it would have been different too if they didn't jump ship on that era of the band with uh, Dehumanizer. I mean, I love Dehumanizer, but it sort of stalled the momentum of the band. And you hear Cozy Pal and Tony Martin talk about this, how disappointed they were because it was like, hey, we're creating this thing, we're building it, we're picking up some momentum, hey, we're getting rolling here. And then all of a sudden they leave for, for Dehumanizer. Uh, and there was always that sort of, uh, they, they go do live aid with Ozzy. There was always sort of this thing of like, I only has one foot out the door or just never really being completely bought into that era. So maybe if there was a bigger label, if the band had just stuck together and said, look, this is, this is it. I'm not, I believe in this band. I believe in this lineup. We're going with it. It, I don't know, maybe, maybe it would have helped a little. I think yeah, the constant right. confusion of who is in the band. I mean, imagine if you're, we're diehard fans and we had trouble keeping track of this. Imagine if you were just like a on the fence Sabbath fan, you've got paranoid and you've got heaven and hell, you know, maybe you got born again and you're trying to follow all this, you know, Tony Martin's there, but wait a minute, Dio's back now. I just saw them at Live Aid with Ozzy. What's going on? Like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so yeah. confusing and it, 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 it makes the, the hardcore, it, it breaks down and wears down the hardcore fan when you're constantly feeling like, you know, what's going to happen next here. And for somebody who's just a casual fan on the periphery, you're probably like, well, what is, what is going on here? I don't under, I don't understand this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they see them at live aid with Ozzy. They, they, then they sure. see tear in the record store and they go and they buy it. And they're like, wait a minute, what, what is it? What is going on here? You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, sure. For the casual fan, but I, I think this, there, there was, there was a, a reaction a real reaction from the black sabbath fan base because i think i know i know i have i mean i've put a real emotional investment in this music i mean there's some songs that that really resonate and i really connect with from the ozzy era and from the dio era and so when the band introduces a new chapter in their career and you listen to it and it doesn't seem like it has as much substance substance as previous eras or the material is being presented in such a way where it's just kind of not as unique. It lacks the qualities that you've, you've grown used to, that you've internalized, and it becomes something else. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a shot, but there really isn't a lot of substance to really uh, grab onto. And, and I think that's another part of it. There, there's some of this stuff 
when we're talking about the Tony Martin era, it lacks some substance. Um, Devil and Daughter, for instance. I'm, look, I'm looking over here at the album. I have the album over leaning up against something. Kill in the Spirit World, Call the Wild. Call the Wild is something that just sounds yeah. very generic. It's really yeah. hard to make an emotional or you know, an intellectual investment in some of these songs because they just sound kind of like by the numbers. And so that was another thing that I think kind of alienated them from the fan base and got the you know, the traditional Black Sabbath fan base, maybe a little bit uh, reluctant to accept this era of the band. Yeah. And like I said, when the members just keep changing like this, you, you really, and especially during that around the eternal idol where, you know, me and you had a, we're texting back and forth earlier today about Deep Purple. And we were talking about Don Airy. Don Airy is, he's, he fits in Deep Purple because Deep Purple to me is like rock royalty. And if you're going to be in Deep Purple, you got to be like, it's like being on the all-star team, you know, for your sport yeah. or something. You got to be like an elite level athlete. You know, you got to be just, this is not for common men do not dine at the table of you know, Deep Purple, right? These guys are rock royalty. They're on a different level. Uh, and so when you're going to have people in a band like Deep Purple, they got to be real high quality people, you know, and they started to get back to that, like bringing Cozy Powell into the band. I think that's a perfect example of that. It was like, hey, we just can't find, we can't bring somebody in who's just an L.A. guy. We really need somebody with some credentials, with some cred, street cred, cred amongst the music community. And Cozy yeah. Pal, he's certainly that guy. He had a resume as, as impressive as anybody going. Uh, but during that weird phase, like Seven Star and the Eternal Idol, it was, it, you know, guys coming in and out of the band and who are these people? Uh, and it just, it really sort of diminished the, the credibility of the band. And we talked about this, I don't care if it was the Eternal Idol or the Seven Star, where we said maybe they should have just stepped back and said, whoa, let's just stop let's just try to straighten this out really you know put something really solid together rather than this just constant revolving door of guys just coming in and out of the band and everything because it really you know it did it 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 uh sank a little bit the the brand of black sabbath where somebody like deep purple i think has been good about you know, really like, hey, we're Deep Purple. You know, if you're going to come into Deep Purple, you got to really, you got to be that upper upper crust here. You know, you really yeah. got to be something special to be in Deep Purple. And it should have been that way with, with Black Sabbath too. And they got away from that for a few years, started to reestablish themselves with Headless Cross and this and Cozy Pal and Neil Murray. But then I, they just can't stop themselves. They, they jump chip for ronnie for one album then they they're flirting with ozzy through all these years there was there was always constant rumors like oh they might get together back get together with ozzy and yeah uh, they go out on the tour with ozzy the knowing ronnie leaves again and it's already getting back together with ozzy and, and it was just this constant like you know thing that it just unfortunately made it really hard to and you didn't want to invest a lot of emotion in them because you felt like they were just going to cheat on you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a relationship. They're just going to, they're just, when you're not looking, they're going to go and, and cheat on you. And just. We, and, we talk about music the way some people talk about sports. We talk about black Sabbath, the way some people talk about their favorite football team or the baseball team or whatever. And, and the similarity is, is there. I mean, when, when you're talking about bands and, and up in our, especially in our podcast, and we're going through the Sabbath albums, uh, in chronological order, and we're talking about a steady band where you have the original four members of Ozzy, Geezer, Bill, and Tony. It's a team, and it's a lot easier to make that investment, that that you know, that emotional investment in your team. You know, there, you, yeah. you you it's easier to connect with them. You know the guys. You know you you've seen their faces. You you've heard them on the records. It's it's easier to, to connect with that. When you get into this era, area where you've got Eric Singer coming in and out, Dave Spitz coming in and out, Neil Murray, he's in, he's out, Geezer's back. Um, 
even Cozy Powell, yeah, Cozy Powell, like he made the reference to, to Don Airy, he's, you know, he's uh, rock royalty. Uh, and Don Airy rules, by the way, and he did a tremendous job, almost the impossible of filling John Lord's shoes. I, I think yeah. it's amazing what a job he's, great job he's done with Deep Purple. But aside from that, um, Cozy Powell comes in on Headless Cross, but his drums are so gated. In yeah. the beginning, like that beat in the beginning yeah. of Headless Cross, it's like it, 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 it almost sounds like it's a drum machine. Yeah, and there are some instances throughout the album where you can hear, Oh, that's cozy, that, that's a cozy fill, but overall, I mean, it, it just sounds sort of nondescript. Um, but when you and again, I'm coming back to the to production aspect, you, you take that away, you take that sheen away, maybe you put Martin Birch at the controls, and you start to maybe you get like. A little bit of that rainbow rising sound. Yeah, more organic. And here's another thing. This is this is probably gonna be my last point. Uh, and we talked about this on, on on our podcast. The band was doing things wrong, and and they were alien for doing things to further alienate the fan base by entertaining the ideas of getting back with Oz. Are they gonna do it? You know, the only reason that was even a relevant situation was because things were not thriving without. Yeah. And that's why the fans were were receptive to that. But when you talk about these all these sporadic decisions and there being a lack of commitment to holding steady and moving things forward with a, with a with a new lineup, it really would have benefited from a manager, somebody outside the box saying, "Look, this yeah. is what we're going to do. Um, this is the game plan. We're going to stick to it." Here's the five year game plan. You know we're exactly. Gonna- the, the, long, there, wasn't, there was no consistent management. There wasn't anybody to really uh, make an investment in in this band, not just financially, yeah. but you know, make this commitment to, uh, or even a personal challenge to make this band successful again. And and knowing the way that they could do it, as from an outside perspective, I mean, the, it was all internal. I think it was Tony thinking, okay, well, I've got, we've got to keep this organization together. This is this is my livelihood. This is what I do. And, you know, so everything was, all the decisions were based from an internal perspective. I think they would have benefited from it. someone on the outside. And of course, management, we had Don Arden and you had Sandy Perlman and then, or Patrick Meehan, even before that, and that ended badly. And then, you know, Don Arden and then Sandy Perlman and then back to Don Arden again. And, and then they're back to, on Eternal Idol with uh, Patrick Meehan Jr. And then his father was looming in the background and they got ripped off again. So the management thing, was another broken aspect of this of this era that i think had some uh yeah some detrimental effects to to the legacy of this era yeah all right well my final thought would be and we we've, we've brought up deep purple a whole bunch of times here what does ian gillen say when for the eighth millionth time somebody says why don't you get richie blackmore back in the band what does ian gillen always say we're happy with steve morris like, granted steve morris is out now for personal reasons but he said he always said we're happy with the band right now we're happy with steve morris end of discussion right he always shoots that stuff down immediately made a commitment it, it made a commitment to to that era of the band and i think Ian understands that if they were just constantly every three to five years doing stuff with Richie comes in, he comes out that it would have, it would have damaged the brand and it would have, the fans wouldn't have been as invested in it maybe. So it would have been nice if maybe Sabbath could have had that same level of conviction to this new era of the band when, when Tony Martin came in, but you never really felt like they did you know nope. which which is sad because we'll leave you with this there's a lot of good stuff in the tony martin era there's a lot of stuff to love there so uh all right so let us know out there what you guys think how did the sound of black sabbath change when tony martin came in the band besides the obvious well he's a different singer of course that you know he's a different singer but how did the sound and what black sabbath was how did that change when tony martin came in let us know what you think of uh our thoughts on it. Make sure you check out our podcast on the Eternal Idol. It's a, it's a, it's one of our longer ones. We go way in depth and expand on a lot of the topics that we were talking about here, and it was a lot of fun. So make sure you check that out. Linked in the description down below. 
And uh, we'll see you at the next Sabbath Sunday.